Alright guys, this is lecture number 8, Smith and the Market Revolution. Inspired by the commercial success of Holland and England, a number of thinkers argue that a commercial society of self-interested producers is good, despite its flaunting of traditional, classical, and Christian virtues. In his famous description of capitalism, Adam Smith argued that only a free market economy can bring the utility of universal opulence, as well as encourage prudential virtues. Smith presented the invisible hand as guiding private self-interest to produce public benefit. While arguing for free trade and government non-interference, Smith diagnosed the social problems of capitalism and justified government action in response. But afterwards, Thomas Mathus made disturbing predictions that food supply puts permanent limit on progress. In this lecture, we enter the age of economic philosophy. The market economy and beneficent order. At least as long as there have been cities, there have been markets. Places where private owners of goods and providers of services conduct trade with those who want their goods and services in a relatively free way. But most economies in history have been dominantly run by tradition in which labor, production, prices, and consumption are set by traditional practice. Another way of managing economics is by state action and control. The government sets prices and production targets. In a market economy, neither tradition nor the state manages wages, prices, and the selection and production of goods and services. Nothing manages them. They are the outcome of innumerable interactions between producers and consumers. This system emerged over the centuries since the Renaissance and by the 18th century, it was a full flower in England. It was becoming the modern economy. There is also a philosophical side to this, the idea that the beneficent order can be a result of unplanned free activity. This would make no sense to Plato, Aristotle or Aquinas. For them, good order requires intelligent design. Even worse than the idea that the free market implies undesigned actions producing good is that self-interest, even greed, is good. What it produces is useful. This was argued by several 18th century thinkers including Bernard de Mandeville, who published the book of, entitled The Fables of the Bees or Private Vices, Public Benefits. Mandeville argued that ascetic religious ideals were harmful for society because holiness encouraged people to want less and discourages worldly ambition. In contrast, public benefits such as new production methods are generated by private biases, just as, such as ambition, greed, and dishonesty. Another supporter was the most famous Enlightenment intellectual of all, Francoise Marie Auret, known as Voltaire. In his letters concerning the English nation, he argued that commerce encouraged peaceful trading relations between otherwise belligerent cultural and religious enemies. The most striking writing on the new commercial society came from writers of the 18th century Scottish Enlightenment, including Francis Hutchinson, Adam Ferguson, David Hume, and Adam Smith. Like Hume, for Smith, all human morals are rooted in the sentiment of sympathy for others in particular or our ability to sympathetically place ourselves in the perspective of others. Ultimately, we observe ourselves from the standpoint of an impartial spectator. This allows Smith to account for the differences between what we regarded as two major classes of virtues, the virtues of self-command, such as honor, cherished by the Roman Stoics, and the ami amiable virtue of Christianity, just, such as benevolence. For Smith, the former occurs when an agent takes the attitude of the spectator, and the latter when the spectator takes the role of the suffering agent. In his theory of the moral sentiments, Smith first noticed that human love of aesthetic utility, the fitness to purpose of the vices, the love of system. He points out that inventors and inventor that inventors pursue such fitness and if they are deceived about the actual benefit to themselves. The self-interest and industry of few is does 
led by an invisible hand to make more widespread benefit. God or nature seems to have arranged things in such a way that the industry of selfish individuals often serves a goal they did not anticipate, usefulness to society at large. Now, the wealth of nations. In 1776, Smith published an inquiry into the nature of and causes of the wealth of nations. Here, he described the core mechanism of free markets as the impulse of, uh, to exchange and the division of labor. The impulses to exchange is Asian, but the division of labor or specialization is a modern development that leads to the greatest productivity. In Smith's analysis of free exchange supply, which is the total of what is brought to market, and the man, which is how many people are willing to buy at the available price, lead the market price to naturally move toward the lowest cost for producing the good or service for a considerable period of time, hence at the natural price. When supply goes up relative to demand, consumer bid prices down. Producers leave the market to sell something else. Supply diminishes and the prices tend to rise again. Conversely, when demand rises relative to supply, producers bid prices up, consumers slow their buying, and prices tend to come down. When supply and demand are equivalent, market price and natural price are equal. Under conditions of free competition, what Smith called perfect liberty, with the absence of monopoly or regulatory interfer interference, the market price will naturally tend toward the natural price. Because the natural price is the lowest price at which production can be continued, this also means that the greatest volume or productivity, more people can afford to buy the commodity. At the same time, high productivity puts money in the hands of the laborer. Smith categorized the factors or components of production, and hence the components of price as stock, meaning capital, investment, including machinery, which yields a profit, labor whose cost is wages and land whose cost is rents and or interest. He also distinguished use value and exchange value. Water is far more useful than diamonds but bring the, brings a much lower market value. Smith accepted the labor theory of value. The value of a thing is the quantity of labor required to produce or bring it to market. Water is easier to get than diamonds. Smith's Smith exalted that goodness of a commercial society in which every man is merchant of his own labor. Like Voltaire, he believed that commerce brings a liberty, peace, and prosperity. Like other 18th century thinkers, he recognized commercial society as a new stage in history. Smith's justification of the free market is clearly utilitarian, not based on natural rights. The market is proving more productive and will spread wealth and promote pacific virtues at the cost of inequality and enhance the vision of labor. Smith specifically championed free trade against mercantilism, the common view in Europe at the time that commerce ought to be regulated for natural, na national ends, resulting in protectionism. Smith points out that the tariff on imported shoes to protect domestic shoe manufactured from being underpriced by foreign producer does no overall benefit to society. It protects only a few manufacturers and their workers at the cost of all domestic consumers paying more for a commodity than they otherwise would. Limits and dangers on the of the free market. Smith was entirely aware of the limit on and dangers of a free market economy. He recognized that several social Social assets cannot be managed by the market, including the military, the courts, public works, and some markets, such as financial institutions, banks, and insurances. He also recognized that free markets increase inequality by making some producers rich, but that is a price of universal opulence. For Smith, the greatest danger of the free market is the division of labor, of labor will destroy the minds of the workers with the numbing uniformity of increasingly minute tax. To prevent this outcome requires public education. The Malthusian Trap 
In an essay on the principles of population, 1798, Thomas Malthus, an English economist, raised a dire objection to the optimistic Enlightenment belief in indefinite future progress. He famously pointed out that the ability of the earth to increase food supply through our agriculture is limited by the amount of land that can be put to production. The food supply can grow only arithmetically. However, every increase in food generates population growth which advances geometrically. Malthus argued that any increase in food supply will result in population growth that will outstrip the food supply, causing starvation and illness until population growth is brought into line. He made this argument to say that population will be checked either by limits on food supply or by morals, that is, delayed marriage and child rearing among the masses. This dismal conclusion would later be called the Malthusian Trap. In fact, humanity was limited by the Malthusian Trap until the 18th century. Since then, it has become clear that agricultural productivity is not arithmetically limited. Land is limited, but food supply can increase nevertheless because of commercial and technological improvements in agriculture. Growth has limits, but they are not what Malthus thought. Intellectual Impact of the Free Market Model the philosophical and intellectual impact of the free market model of economics cannot be overestimated. First, it introduced the notion of spontaneous order, that good or beneficial order can come from massive numbers of local interaction without centralized coordination. If one novel idea is at uh, the heart of modernity, it is this one. It even turned out to be crucial for Darwinian evolution. Smith was also one of the moderns who explicitly endorsed the notion that property, education, and opportunity serve as the commercial versions of the martial spirit of the great body of the people. Smith held that we can have a kind of public spiritedness, a willingness to support the community in a commercial society, although it will particularly require education. The social bond will be less martial than in shared self-interest among educated property owners, BC, with the improvement of their lives, families, and communities. With the acceptance of the market, the reaction of the ideal virtue that dominated political theory before Machiavellian Hobbes was pushed further, self-interest is good and even avarice is beneficial. There is no precedent for this in the pre-modern tradition. Finally, Smith recognition that not merely the ambition to truck and barter by the division of labor vastly increases productivity, capacity was also new and would be central to the development of modern economy and society. As Emily Durkheim, the French sociologist, would later say, the division of labor is an entirely new way of connecting people into a social whole, and all this would shift and complicate the notion people have of themselves, of society, and of the aim of human life.